make sure it's working. Picking up with the seafarer on page 68. <clears throat> if I need to write stuff up on the board, I'll do that rather than try to pull that down. So this is another elegy, right? Um, the wanderer and the seafarer are often read as companion pieces, even though they're not back-to-back -back within the manuscript that, that they exist in. These are the only copies, by the way, of these two poems. They don't survive anywhere else. Okay? So you have the wanderer and the seafarer. The wanderer, notice the titles. Okay? Titles are modern inventions. The titles are not in the manuscript. So we call the one the wanderer. Why? Because there is this guy at the beginning of the poem who is called the Anhaga, the solitary one. The poem could just as well be called the solitary one. But what does he talk about throughout the course of the poem? Kind of wandering around, looking for, you know, new lord, etc. Does that mean that this poem is talking all about seafaring? Well, the sea does figure prominently in it, but the sea also figures prominently in the wanderer. So, titles aren't necessarily descriptive or definitely not authorial. Whoever the author, we have no idea who the authors are. Okay. So, the seafarer begins. I can sing a true song of myself, tell of my journeys, how in days of toil I've often suffered troubled times, endured hard heartache, come to know many of care's dwellings on the keel of a ship, terrible tossing of the waves, where the anxious night watch often held me at the ship's stem when it crashes against the cliffs. Not quite the same beginning as the wanderer, but it does have some of the same ideas. You know, days of toil, troubled times, heartache, endurance, and being in a ship during storms. Pinched with cold were my feet, bound by frost and cold fetters. Why? Okay, we're not talking, you know, the Queen Elizabeth II. We're not talking a cruise line. What kind of ship are we talking? Okay, wooden ship. What else? Very small. Very small, like a one-person ship. Very good. Probably what's called a coracle. This is a very, very small You can't see it very well. About the size of this desk or table, that is, about this long, or maybe about that wide. Kind of shaped like a leaf, or kind of oval, like that. Okay? One person sits inside and moves through the water with hands rather than oars necessarily. Okay? Very small. These were apparently, I don't want to say fairly common, somewhat common, among the Irish monks and hermits of Ireland. You know, the, the scene in the latest Star Wars, you know, where what's your name meets um, uh, Luke Skywalker, okay? That island is one of the islands that monks settled. Okay? The, everything that you see in that quote unquote set. That's a thousand years old. In fact, when they actually filmed the first one where they went there, they damaged it. So that the Irish and I think the UN said, you can't go back. You can't, you can't redo it because they damaged some of the steps. It's a World Heritage Site. Okay? So the, the Irish monks would go out on the ocean in these little ships and some of them just go out in the ocean and, and stay for a while. Not go out and you know, throw an anchor overboard and just sit there. But they would go out and just row and pray. We'll talk about that more in a moment. So, pinched with cold were my feet. Why? Bound with by frost in cold fetters. Where you're, you're talking about a boat with a very low draft. I mean, a very shallow draft. That is, it doesn't sink down into the water much. So if you're rowing like this, what's going to happen? You're getting water splashed inside. Whether we're talking the Irish Sea, the North Sea, or the North Atlantic, we're not talking the Gulf of Mexico. So the water's cold, really. 
No, does he mean literally bound with frost? His feet are encased in ice. Probably not. But water can be 33 degrees and be really, really cold. I don't know what the coldest water you've been in, but I've been in about 48 and not long. <laughs> so, he says, bound in frost by frost and cold fetters, while cares seethed hot around my mind. So, the body is physically cold, but his mind is what? Hot. It's like it's on fire. Not because he has a fever. Okay? Because of the troubles that are plaguing his mind. It's like his mind is burning. Okay? Because he's wrestling with whatever these problems are. While care seeds hot, sorry, around my heart, not my mind. Hot around my heart and hunger gnawed my sea weary mind. So, body is cold, heart is troubled, and his mind's thinking of what? Mm -hmm. I'm hungry. Okay? So, this person's undergoing some deprivation, right? He's undergoing heat deprivation, he's undergoing joy deprivation, and he's undergoing food deprivation. Okay? That man does not know. He whose lot is fairest on land, how I dwelt all winter, wretched with care, on the ice-cold sea, in the paths of exile, deprived of dear kinsmen, hung with icicles of frost, while hail flew in showers. Remember how the wanderer said, he who has experienced, da 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 seafarer does just the opposite. Okay? His mind is what? Sea-weary. Well, you can kind of assume if he's weary of being on the sea, why not just row back to shore? Okay. Hmm. Hold that question. So the person who doesn't know, he whose lot is fairest on land. Does that mean the rich person is the one percent? Is that what he's talking about? The king or the duke? Not necessarily. He means the person who has a good life on land. Well, in comparison to this speaker, doesn't really anybody on land have a good life? Have a fairer position than he does? Right. That person whose lot is fairest on land does not know, does not know what? How I dwelt all winter. And again, I, I think we have to, one, imaginatively read this, but also to geographically read this. Again, we're, we're not talking Tahiti. We're not talking the Bahamas or Bermuda. We're talking northern latitudes. Okay? So all winter means cold, brutally cold, out on the ocean. Not with, you know, not in this kind of, ship that has a little house on top where you can go inside and get a little bit warm. Exposed to the elements. How I dwelt all winter, there's that word, wretched with care. It's rakta, as we talked about the other day. On the ice cold sea, what? In the rakklastas, in the paths of exile. So the speaker's telling us, I am following the path of exile. I'm in exile. I am in exile, and I am in exile. Okay? Why? Deprived of dear kinsmen. And you've got a gloss telling you, a half line may be missing here. Why? Because there's not enough stressed syllables. The second line, second half of that line may be missing. There are some examples in Old English and other Germanic literatures where you do get a short line like this. Does it follow all that, all those rules for Germanic literate meter? No, it doesn't. But as with almost all rules, there are every now and then exceptions. This may just be an exception. It may not be that there's something missing. Hung with icicles of frost. While hail, hail flew in showers. 
Who's doing the hanging with icicles of frost? The speaker. So the speaker says, I have icicles of frost hanging from me. Are they hanging from his arms? No. What more than likely are they hanging from? Beard, hair, mustache. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody with little teeny icicles hanging from their eyebrows or sometimes eyelids. If your eyes tear up and it's really cold, guess what? It freezes fast. All right? Not a pleasant condition, right? I heard nothing there but the noise of the sea, the ice cold waves. I think that I hear I heard nothing is kind of juxtaposed, juxtaposed with deprived of dear kinsmen. Because if he was with dear kinsmen, what it would the speaker likely be hearing throughout the winter. Well, you got to go back to that hall and what happens in the hall? The singing of songs. He doesn't have that. What does he hear? The wild swan's song, sometimes served for music. Again, it's called and the curlews cry for the laughter of men. So, music, strumming of the harp, and then we get the gannets call, the curlews cry, laughter, the seagull singing for mead drink. And I don't think that means the seagull singing was like drinking mead, because drink mead, and what does it do? Well, you drink enough, it gives you a buzz. Hearing the seagulls not giving him a buzz. He's talking, I think, about the clinking of wooden goblets and metal goblets together. The sound drinking makes of a bunch of people sitting around a table and you're hearing those goblets hit and you're hearing wine or mead being poured from bottles into. All right? Storms beat the stone cliffs. The tern answered, icy feathered. The eagle screamed, dewy feathered. No sheltering family could bring consolation to my desperate soul. Consolation. What is consolation? Almost, Louder? Almost like comforting. Comforting. Okay. What else? I mean, yes, it is comforting. It's comforting for a loss. Okay. What else? Peace. Peace. What word is at the root of that? Okay. Close. It's the soul part. It's soulless. Okay. The con means what? With. Together. It's soulless with. So he's saying, I didn't have any family to do what? To, to give me solace, to give me peace, to give me warmth, to give me joy, to give me love, to give me friendship, to give me human companionship. All right? So none of that brought consolation to my desolate soul. Desolate. What is something that is desolate? Desert. Desert? Why? Void of life. Void of life? Okay, what else? Mars. Okay, Mars. <laughs> it's got rocks. It's void of life. It's empty, right? What else can be desolate? A classroom without people in it is desolate. Why? It's not being used. To use the word that was used in the wanderer, I think it might be the same word, just being translated slightly differently here. It's edel, idle. Not I-D-O-L, I-D-L-E. Not being used. Okay. His desolate, his not being used soul 
His empty soul, his lifeless soul, well, his soul can't be lifeless, otherwise he wouldn't be speaking. This isn't, you know, William Faulkner, you know. <laughs> we, we have dead people be narrators and such. And so, gloss. The repeated word, connecting word, forethought is notoriously difficult in this poem. It points forwards and or backwards, meaning either therefore or thus or because. In a poem whose logical progression is by no means clear or easy to follow, this is a significant source of ambiguity. Well, poems are notoriously what? Ambiguous. You're writing a poem for a creative writing class. You want it to be ambiguous. You're writing a term paper for this kind of class. You don't want there to be any ambiguity. You want it to be crystal clear. Smack me upside the head so I go, oh yeah, well, that's really good. I understand that completely. I don't want to go, hmm, what the hell does this person mean? Because that's not going to get a good grip. <laughs> okay? So, Liuza says, I've chosen to render it with the vague and so. That is, it's ambiguous in the original. Let's just follow with the ambiguity hoping to preserve some of the loose connection and interpretive difficulty found in the original. And so, the Old English is forethought. Does it mean therefore? Which is da 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 thus, summary, or is it because? It's unclear. And so, he who has tasted life's joy in towns, suffered few sad journeys, scarcely believes, proud and puffed up with wine, what I, weary, have often had to endure in my seafaring. Now let's unpack that, because there's a lot of a positive phrases there, okay? He who tasted has tasted life's joys in towns. That is, the person who has experienced the joys of human companionship in town, comma, suffered few said journeys. That is, and he who has suffered few sad journeys, okay? So it's not only tasting life's joys and towns, but also suffered few sad journeys. That person, what? Scarcely believes. Now this might be Lytotes. How scarcely, how difficult does he find to believe this? It's impossible, he doesn't believe it at all. Believes what? Proud and puffed up with wine. This is going back and describing the person who has experienced life's joys and towns, who has scarcely, or excuse me, who has suffered few sad journeys, he has difficulty believing. Why? Because he is proud and puffed up with wine, believing what I, weary, weary. Is that just tired? No, it's tired on steroids. It's exhausted, okay? What I, weary, have often had to endure in my seafaring. The implication is, that it's like the speaker says, every now and then I go back to town and all those fat, dumb slobs don't believe a word of what I say. Why not? They haven't experienced it. They haven't experienced it. They've never seen it for themselves. The night shadow darkened. I love that phrase. Nicht Shua. Shua kind of implies this living thing, like the night is alive, and it gets darker and darker and darker. Snow came from the north. Frost bound the ground. Hail fell on earth, coldest of grains. Fourth on, therefore, and so, because, they compel me now. What's the they? Next line. My heart thoughts. Heart thoughts. Does that mean thoughts of my heart? My inner longing? Okay. Those things, whatever they are, they compel me now to do what? To try for myself. That verb try, what does it mean? Is it pretend? No, I said attempt. Oh, sorry. attempt, sorry. <laughs> attempt, good. What else does it mean? Risk. Attempt, 
risk. Effort. It implies effort. What other word do we use often as synonym for try? Prove. Both of these, by the way, come from the medieval tradition of alchemy. Because what are you doing? You are, and there's a third word that comes in, also from alchemy. You are testing. What are you doing? You're testing, you're trying, you're proving what? Ultimately in the alchemical tradition, to try to come up with the philosopher's stone. Okay? That's why we have test tubes. So, to try for myself, to attempt for myself, to prove, not for, to myself, or to just remove the preposition entirely, to prove myself, to try myself, to test myself. Notice, it's the self that's going in the proverbial test tube. It's the thing being examined. Okay? Being proven to determine what it is. To try for myself the high seas, the tossing salt streams. My heart's desire urges my spirit time and again to travel. My heart's desire, that thing that is greatest inside, urges my spirit, because my spirit is different than my heart's desire. Urging me time and again to do what? To travel. Why? So that I might seek a foreign land somewhere far from here. A foreign land somewhere far from here. Does that mean like uh, he left the coast of Wales and he's going over to Ireland? That's a foreign land. I mean, if you're in one of those little boats, you know, six feet by four feet, that's far from here. Okay. A mile distance would be a far distance of travel in something like that. Is he getting like Ron Hayes castaway? Okay. <laughs> a foreign land that is not what? Not discovered. Not discovered. What else? Not home. Not home. Okay. And so, no man on earth is so proud in spirit. No man on earth, not the fat, dumb, and happy guy in the land or in the city, not somebody like me in my little boat in the ocean, no one. We immediately know this is a gnomic or wisdom kind of saying. It's applying to everybody. No man on earth is one, so proud in spirit, nor two, so gifted in grace. Nor three, so keen in youth. What does keen mean? Sharp. Yeah, it's not really happy. It's sharp. It's, you know, excessive, okay, in youth. Nor four, bold in deeds. Nor five, so beloved of his Lord that he never has sorrow over his seafaring. So, no one has these five characteristics who, that never has sorrow over his seafaring when he sees what the Lord might have in store for him. What does the, when he sees what the Lord might have in store for him mean? And the idea is, you're going off on this journey. What's the end point of the journey? Seeing what the Lord might have in store. Is that knowing at the beginning what that is? No. Is the guy talking about getting into his little boat and knowing exactly what his destination is? Nope. Why not? Because he has no idea what the Lord has in store for him. And his journey can take him wherever and however long it may go until he find what the Lord is telling him to see or find. And because Lusa translates Lord, capital L, that probably means God, okay? 
What might this seafaring journey therefore mean? Could it mean like the poor land someone bought near the mountain? Could. And that could be what the foreign land far from here means. But what about the seafaring journey? What might that mean? Yes. It very much could be. In other words, each one of us is a seafarer. Do we know, quote unquote, when we're born, what the Lord has in store for us? No, because I think a whole bunch of us would go, hell no, I'm going back. <laughs> Yes. Would it be reasonable to say that uh, the author is making the argument that those who decide to pursue a seafaring life are pursuing a spiritual and religious life, and those who are in the meat all safe are remaining secular? Yeah, that's very possible. Right. Okay. We're going to get to some of that in just a moment. He has, that is, the person who does this kind of seafaring who is not so proud in spirit, nor so gifted in grace, nor so keen in youth, nor so bold in deeds, nor so beloved of his Lord, he has no thought of the harp or the taking of rings. That is, what does he think about the hall? Nothing. It's no longer important. Now, the other day, what did I say about the hall for an Anglo-Saxon warrior? It's everything. It's, everything. it's your identity. Okay. He is saying it means nothing. Okay. What else? He has no thought of the harp or the taking of rings, nor the pleasures of woman, nor joy in the world. So, harp, rings, women, joy. Nor anything else but tumbling waves. He who hastens to see always has longing. That is, he's kind of channeling oh, blood. a thousand years before he wrote it, Bono's sitting there, you know, at a keyboard or something. I said, see, how do I get these lyrics? I still haven't found what I'm searching for. Well, where did Bono get the idea for those lyrics? About 1,500 years earlier, a guy named Augustine, a bishop, of Hippo in North Africa talked about in his confessions coming to this realization he had this big gaping hole in his heart. And he describes it as a God-sized hole. And he tried to fill that hole with what? What he just described here. Primarily the third thing. Women. He was known for his Raunchy sexual behavior until he found Jesus. Or more radically, accurately, according to Augustine, Jesus found him. Okay? And filled that hole. Okay? And writers ever since then have been talking about that hole that people try to fill how? Sex, money, drugs, rock and roll, <laughs> cars, material stuff. Pharmaceutical stuff, you know, stuff. So, he goes on. The groves take blossom, that is, the trees, ours aren't going to for another month or so. The trees bloom, right? The cities grow fair, that is, they get larger, the people are beautiful in them, so to speak. The fields brighten. The world rushes on. All of those two lines is talking about one thing. Time passes. Right? Time never stops. Unless you die. <laughs> it's the carpe diem, kind of. He hasn't said, seize the day, you know. All these, that is time passing on. All these urge the eager-hearted spirit to travel. Eager-hearted. The one whose heart is seeking something. It's eager for what? It does not know. It's longing, as he already said. When one intends to journey far over the floodways. Okay. Now, each of those things, the groves take blossom, the cities grow fair, the fields brighten, that all describes what time of the year? Spring. 
spring. Everything comes alive again. And he says, and that's the time I desire to get out. You're going to see the same thing with Chaucer. One that the prayer with is sure, so to the druck of merch of person to the road to da 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 then long and folk to go on a pilgrimage. What's he talking about? When the rains have ended and the spring comes, what do people want to do? It's not as bad here in Middle Tennessee, but move to Alaska, move to Sweden, where it's dark. You do not see the sun at all for four or five months. What happens when spring comes? You gotta get out, man. Because what are you suffering from? Cabin fever. Cabin fever right? He's kind of getting at that idea. Even the cuckoo urges with its sad voice. Summer's guardian announces sorrow, bitter in the breast door. Now, he's saying the cuckoo is doing what? As summer wears down. It's saying the earth is dying. Winter's coming. He does not know, uh, announces bitter in the breastword. He does not know. He who, not the cuckoo, well, the person might be cuckoo, but that's another point. He does not know the man blessed with ease. Jeff Bezos. He's, he's been my go-to person to use as an example lately. I read something the other day. He's worth now $112 billion. Billion. You know, like the Tennessee state budget's only like 25 or $40 billion a year. Jeff Bezos can pay for that and still have a you-know-what load of money left over, okay? The man blessed with ease does not know what. What those endure who walk most widely in the paths of exile. Does that mean taking big, long steps widely like that? No. What does it mean? Really leave. Their homelands behind. Who really go off in exile. And so, there's that fourth on. Now my thought flies out from my breast. Well, what did the wanderers say? You want a good reputation. You want fame. You want glory. What do you do with your thoughts? Bind them up. Keep them. Don't share them with anybody else. So he says, my thought flies out from my breast. My spirit moves with the sea flood, roams widely over the whale's home to the corners of the earth, and comes back to me greedy and hungry. Some people have said, well, maybe when he got some provisions, he got some of the wrong kind of mushrooms, and he is hallucinating that this is an astral projection. He's sending his spirit out over the surface of the earth. Okay. Or it could just be, he's what? Projecting. He's thinking of what it would be like out there. And it comes back to him what? Greedy and hungry. What else might this be an elusive image to? What happens when the rains stop in Noah's flood? He opens a window. Sends out dove or pigeon, I can't remember which, and what happens? It flies and flies and flies and flies, and it comes back hungry. Why? Nowhere to land. Well, it could be elusive of that. It goes out, he sends his spirit out, and it comes back what? Greedy and hungry, desiring what? The me. <laughs> The soul, the lone flyer cries out, incites my heart irresistibly to the whale's path over the open sea. The lone flyer is probably referring to like a solitary seagull. Incites my heart irresistibly to the whale's path over the open sea. The whale's path. I'm trying to remember how to spell it. Juan Rada. <coughs> Okay. Raga is the word from which we get road. Juan is another word for whale. The whale road. What in the world is he talking about? This is a kinning. Okay. 
Okay? It's a way of describing something without saying what it is. Or the way I usually define it, it's a metaphor of a metaphor. Okay? So what's the whale road? It's the ocean. It's the street that the whale takes. Okay? So he says, it incites my heart out there over the open sea. Why? Because hotter to me are the joys of the Lord than this dead life. Period. End of statement. End of sentence. End of idea. No. Hotter to me are the joys of the Lord than this dead life. Lana. There's that word we saw the other day, which is translated, possibly, loaned, transitory, impermanent, changing, mutable, and if you want, lean. It's not full of good, juicy fat. Right? Loaned on land. Now look at your clause. At this point, the sea voyage is revealed to be a journey of spiritual discovery. Not necessarily. That point might actually, I think, be earlier in the poem. When he says, so that I might seek a foreign land somewhere far from here. Because what would be the ultimate live? The ultimate foreign land far from here. Yeah, Amelia's pointing. There! Okay. In Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, let me back up, Tolkien's Silmarillion, he has events happen in such a way, let me back up even further. At the beginning of the Silmarillion, when Iru Iluvatar creates, he doesn't create everything on his own. He sings these quote-unquote angelic beings into being, and then he has them sing, and they sing a song, and this one guy kind of puts discord into it, and he tells him to stop. And then he says, okay, stands at the conductor stand, you know. He conducts, they sing, Melkor introduces more discord, cuts him off. Third time, sing, they sing, Melkor introduces even more discord. This time, Aru Lubitar stands up. He's really pissed, okay? And he says, now let me show you what you've done. You thought you were just singing. You weren't. You were creating he pulls out the film, fast forwards, and he shows them the whole history of the universe. They see it all play out in front of their eyes. And he says, and Melkor, by the way, every time you enter, in, introduce Discord, here's what happened. This was evil. Okay? But to show you that I am a Rue and you're not, I took that Discord and produced Concord out of it each time. Okay? So, fast forward. The world is created, the world that we know is created, and it's flat. Like, this is flat. Like, this is flat. It is flat, flat. Okay? And on one side, in an island, on an island, okay, or in a land, live the gods. And then there's an island off in the middle of the ocean, and then over here is what is called Middle Earth. All right? But at one point in quote unquote history, Things all fall apart because the people over here in Middle Earth are idiots and they're brought over to the gods and they do some bad stuff like killing each other in the land of the gods so the gods kind of kick them out. Okay? And then the people who live in the island follow one of the false gods, so to speak. And so what happens? And Ruluvatar bends the world. So you used to be able to go from Middle Earth to what's called Valinor. Think of Olympus. You know, you could fly over to Greece, get to the base of Mount Olympus, walk up, up to the top, and talk to Zeus. You could leave Middle Earth, sail across the ocean, go to Valinor, talk to Manwe and the other gods. Okay? But after the world is bent, what it's called, it's bent, it's made into a ball, you can no longer get on that boat and sail to Valinor. Because it's not like Valinor's now down here. It's Valinor has been removed. Okay. There's only very few exceptions where you can. And that's like when you have Galadriel and Gandalf and 
Le uh, yeah, Legolas and Elrond and all these other, you know, half elves or elves, or in the case of Gandalf, an angel, that's what he is, okay, go off with you. And they kind of know the secret combination and the secret way to <whistles> go off there, okay? That's kind of what he's saying here. My journey is going to be off this way and in. Okay. He mentions the voyage of Latin voyage of St. Brendan. The hermit monks of Ireland had a particular penchant for taking to small boats and trusting in God for their safety. I love that language. They had a particular penchant. You know, they got a wild hair, in other words, and said, hey, let's go off in a little tiny boat off of the big, mighty Atlantic and just believe. Some reached Iceland in their little tiny small boats. Some are rumored to have reached the Americas. Like St. Brendan is rumored to have reached the Americas. Okay? Many others, no doubt, found rest at the bottom of the sea. So much for trusting in God. Okay? So, I will never believe... Uh, that earthly goods will endure forever. I notice, not can never believe, I will, I don't choose to believe that earthly goods will endure forever. Well, what kind of moron, literally, would think earthly goods endure forever? Because what earthly good doesn't endure forever? This one. Because I used to be your age, <laughs> and now I'm not. And at some point, I will not be. And at some point, you will not be. Okay? I think most of us would say, this is an earthly good while it lasts. More so while it's younger than after it gets older. Always for everyone, gnomic, when it applies to everyone, you're in wisdom kind of language. One of three things hangs in the balance before it's time. It sounds like Al Gore the future hanging in the balance. So what are these three things that hang in the balance? Now this guy's just a bowl of cheer, isn't he? <laughs> Illness or age or attacked by the sword rests life away from one doomed to die. The doomed to die fire which is related to our word for feud but it's also dated. Because guess what? All of us, we are all fine. <clears throat> We're all doomed to die, right? How? Illness or age or attack by the sword? Yeah, I know. He didn't have automobiles. He didn't have, you know, crazy blowing up planes. And, and so for every man, the praise of posterity, those coming after, is the best eulogy. It's the best word spoken by those who come after, is what the, more closely what the original says. So, for everybody, we want this. Do you know anybody, have you ever met anybody, who says, you know, when I die, I don't want anybody to know I ever existed. I just don't want to leave any mark at all. I just, you know, want to be like a dust in the wind, just blow off. And... No! Everybody wants to know they've left a mark. Okay? The poor pecs, the people after whom this God-forsaken building is named, this is what they get remembered for. 1960s brutalist East German architecture designed to kill the soul. You know? There's nothing wonderful about this building. They were long-standing members, chairs of this department. All right? But people don't remember that as much anymore. All they know is Peck Hall. <laughs> we want to be remembered. We want to know somebody knew I lived or I existed. So, how do you do that? 
You get somebody to say a eulogy. He's not talking literally about somebody standing up. Ted Sherman was a good man. That's all I can think of. You know, that's not a very good eulogy, right? No. So how do you get that good word? How do you get posterity to remember you? Before he must be on his way. Wonderful euphemism. Sorry, i got to leave now. I'm on my way. It's like you know Emily Dickinson's. Because I could not stop for death, he stopped for me. Gentlemen callers, like Clark Gable, coming up in the carriage is almost as she describes it. Before he must be on his way, he act what? Bravely on earth against the enemy's malice. The enemies, it's plural. All right. Is this earthly enemies? Is this the enemy of your country, your nation, your people, your tribe, your family? Could be. Do bold deeds to beat the devil. Well, that's a little bit more specific. Because, you know, unless you're a wacko, I don't think you would say even, you know, um, can't remember his first name, Baghdadi, the guy who's, you know, if he's still alive, the head of ISIS. He's not the devil. He's misguided, but he's not the devil. All right? Hitler was misguided. He wasn't the devil. He was bad. Stolen. Not the devil. A lot of people died because of him. 60 to 100 million. Doesn't make him the devil. Okay? So, what? The sons of men will salute him afterwards. Does it mean, like, in heaven? He'll die, and the sons of men who die after him will come up and go, way to go, you did a good job down there. They mean, the writer means, we'll salute him in his death. We'll speak fondly about him. After all, we're going to start next week, Beowulf. If Beowulf lived, he died in the 6th century, and we're still reading about him. Well, let's take Beowulf out, because he's fictional. JFK, who does every modern Democrat who becomes president get compared to? JFK. JFK was not actually that great a president. Okay, okay Harry Truman. FDR, there's the granddaddy of them all, you know. The founder of the modern American government, so to speak. All right? Republicans, who is their FDR? Yeah. Who Rush Limbaugh calls Ronaldus Magnus, Ronald the Great, like Charlemagne, Charles the Great. So, why? So the sons of men will salute him afterwards, and his praise thereafter live with the angels. Now that is in heaven, forever and ever, in the joy of eternal life, delight among heaven's hosts. Now, shouldn't he just kind of stop there? It, isn't that a natural stopping point? Do such deeds so that the angels go, wait to go, for all eternity. It'd be kind of nice to have people applauding you for the days are lost. And all the pomp of this earthly kingdom, there are now, okay, now, whenever this is written, or first composed. Maybe it's composed around 800. The manuscript dates from around 1000 AD. There are now neither kings nor emperors nor gold givers as there once were. What old trope is the speaker bringing up? I remember when men were men. Kings were kings and strong and mighty. Like Caesar. Like Hercules. Like Achilles. Like Charlemagne, maybe. Like David of old. And Solomon. And go back even farther. Samson. Okay? That's, he's talking about the heroes of old. Nostalgia. So what's he saying about now? Now we get Donald Trump, you know. <laughs> now we get Obama. Now we get W. Now we get, compared to those guys, weaklings, panty wastes. When they did the greatest glorious deeds and lived in most lordly fame. All this noble host is fallen. Now, he could be talking about a literal noble host. He could be, you know, at Arlington National Cemetery and saying, they're 
all dead. These were all noble at one time. Lost my place. All this noble host has fallen, their happiness lost. The weaker ones remain and rule the world. The old English there that leaves it translates weaker, it's not weaker. It's worser. The worser. See, weak implies what? Physical or bodily strength. Worse implies, can't imply that. It can also imply moral abilities or capabilities. Or people just aren't as good as they used to be. Or our leaders aren't. The weaker ones remain and rule the world, laboring and toiling. It's not like they're not trying, right? Joy is laid low. That might be Lytotes. How low is joy laid? It's non-existent. In other words, maybe life now is only labor and toil. And then you die. <laughs> joy is laid low. The earth's nobility grows old and withers like every man throughout Middle Earth. Old age overtakes him. His face grows pale. The gray beard grieves. He knows his old friends, offspring of princes, have been given up to the earth. That is the old guy who lives when his friends die. All they can do is think about his friends. When his life fails him, his fleshly cloak will neither taste the sweet nor touch the sore. That is, when you die, you can't taste, you can't touch, what else? Nor move a hand, nor think with his mind. Though a brother may wish to strew his brother's grave with gold, bury him among the dead with heaps of treasure to take with him. He's talking, I think, about the practice of old, when we had great kings and leaders. And what would you do? Put them in, in a tomb with all their stuff, you know? Go to the British Museum in London. Take my Harry Potter course in London this summer. Go to the British Museum in London and visit the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, which is bigger than this room. It's to bury one dead guy. There was a grave discovered in Greece about three years ago, which initially was thought to be the tomb of Alexander the Great. Because this sucker is huge. It is a single tomb that encompasses an acre. An acre for one person. Okay? Opened it up. It's got this great symbolism on lintels and stuff. And you're like, who is this? Now they think it might actually be Philip of Macedonia, Alexander's father, or, I'm trying to remember, one of Alexander's wives. Something like that. It's been a long time since I've read about it, okay? So what's he talking about? You know, a brother might want to do what? Bury his brother with all kinds of stuff. Why? Because that's honoring him. It's not necessarily what anthropologists tell us. Oh, they thought it was going to help them in their journey to the other life. Not necessarily. <laughs> Sometimes it's just a means of honoring them. Why do people spend $5,000 or $10,000 or more to put a body in a box. What's going to happen to that box? It's going to rot away within about 20 or 30 years. Okay. Why waste that much money? Because you're honoring the person. Okay. So, though a brother may wish to strew his brother's grave with gold, bury him among the dead with heaps of treasure to take with him, that gold will be useless before the terror of God, for any soul that is full of sin, the gold he had hidden while here on earth. Notice what he's saying about the gold. The gold that is buried with the dead guy, the dead guy did what with it while he was alive on earth? He hid it. Modern terminology, he did what with it? Put it in the bank. He didn't do what with it? 
didn't share it. Now, what do you mean by share? Got to get an Anglo Anglo-Saxon mindset. Uh, give, out to those give out to those who are less, you know, rich. Okay. He's not necessarily, though he might be, he's not necessarily talking about the giving of alms. We hand out money to the poor. Okay? He might be. I had a doctoral student write a dissertation on poems in the Exeter book that it was a handbook for princes about the distribution of alms. You want to be a good prince or good king, give alms. Distribute wealth to the poor. All right? That's one meaning. Another one is, what's, remember, you know, king or chieftain things. What's the relationship? I'll fight for you, you do what? Give me, give me treasure. Might be implying he didn't distribute treasure. Right? I like the, the, the alms part actually more because of the context of the poem. So what did he do with his gold? He hid it. He kept it all to himself. And notice, and that ain't going to do you any good before the terror of God. Great is the terror of God before which the earth trembles. It's like he's been reading the Psalms. He established the sturdy foundation of the earth's solid surface and the high heavens. Foolish is he, wisdom, gnomic verse. Foolish is he who dreads not the Lord. Why? Because Proverbs says, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Might be Psalms. Pretty sure it's Proverbs. Death will find him unprepared. Hmm. What does the speaker mean? Foolish is he who dreads not the Lord. Death will find him unprepared. What's this? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. What else? Why not? Okay. So what's the speaker saying about death? What must one do before death? Fear God? Louder, Amelia. Prepare, prepare. How do you prepare yourself for death? Is it merely, you know, shelling out four grand to buy a plot? Pay, you know, put money aside to get that coffin so that it's not, you know, you're not a burden for your family? I mean, you're already dead. Now you're going to be a double burden by making them pay for a coffin for you? No, it's not that. I mean, it could be. What's it mean to prepare for death? Prayer. Live piously, possibly. What else? Possibly. More basic. Give away all your stuff, put it all in the right places. Okay, that's, that's less basic, but that's, I mean, that's part of it. More basic, even more basic than that. What must everyone confront? Louder? Their death. I will die. That's why I said, very basic. Okay? Because we tend to have a mentality, what? Especially the younger we are. I'm invincible. Nothing's going to hurt me. Yeah, we'll try running out into, you know, Interstate 24 at rush hour around, oh, I don't know, Briley Parkway and do that. No longer invincible, you are now a speck of dust on the, you know, grill of a Mack truck. Okay? Prepare how? Knowing you must die and therefore living in such a way that what? What happens if you die now? And I'm not talking about the Baptist turn or burn. Repent now or burn forever, you know. <laughs> not that. Just the prepare so that when death comes, it's not a surprise. This is what I argue in my Harry Potter courses. It's the whole meaning of the Harry Potter books. It's all about one thing, how to die well. Because there are people in the books who don't die well. And they stick around. <clears throat> kind of. 
We like the characters in the one. Pirate of the Caribbean. I can't remember which one because we're up to what? You know, Pirate 16? <laughs> it's the one where, you know, um, Barbosa drinks the wine and you see it in his rotted belly. And he eats the apple and says it has no taste. Is that the first one? Yeah. Really? Wow. Okay. It's kind of a cursed half-life, right? It's not really being alive or really being dead. So... Foolish is he who dreads not the Lord. What does that mean? He doesn't think there is a Lord. He says, this is it. This is everything. This is all there is. Death will find him unprepared. Because the speaker is saying, guess what? He dies. He goes through that door. Okay. And Hamlet calls the entry into the undiscovered country from whose board no one returns. <laughs> And it's what? It's an undiscovered country. That is, it is not merely the end of consciousness. There is something there. And there's somebody on the other side saying, Hi, my name's God. <laughs> you screwed up. <laughs> and according to some theology, go to hell. Because <laughs> you never X, Y, Z. Blessed is he, more of the gnomic verse, who lives humbly. Yeah, but we're talking about Anglo-Saxons here. Okay. Not necessarily known for their humility. Well, take that back. Depends on if we're talking early Anglo-Saxons or late Anglo-Saxons. Early Anglo-Saxons, before the coming of Augustine and Sect, before the coming of Roman Christianity, or Anglo-Saxons of about 1000 AD, who have been Christian for over 300 years. As Christian as quote-unquote, I don't even know if I can use this phrase anymore, Christian America. You know, 1800 America, so to speak. Or the, you know, Puritan Enlightenment, uh, Great Awakening America. You know, late 1600s. Blessed is he who lives humbly. Mercy from heaven comes to him. Notice, mercy comes. It's not that he asks for mercy. It just comes. Go back to the beginning of the wanderer. Oft him on the haga, ara ye beateth, metudas milza. Often the solitary one experiences, awaits, expects, endures, favors, mercies, graces, the mercy of God. Right. Notice, is the solitary one Asking for it? We're never told. Please, God. It just either happens or he's waiting for it to happen. If he's just waiting for it to happen, who else can he be waiting like? Any of you had any absurdist theater courses? 20th century drama? Uh, the, the two guys. Were waiting for Godot. Oh. Okay. Samuel Beckett's great mid 20th century play. Absurdist. So, mercy from heaven comes to him. The maker strengthens his spirit, for he, the person who is strengthened, believes in his might. He trusts in God, and God blesses him for that. A man must steer a strong mind and keep it stable. What does that mean, keep it stable? Deviate. Don't deviate. What does that mean? Be consistent. Be consistent. That is, not like this. Up and down. In other words, you want what? If you're in a boat on the ocean, the phrase, an even keel. Okay? Keep it stable. Steadfast in its promises. What do the wanderers say? Don't make a boast until what? Until you know what your mind's going to say when you come into that situation. Okay? Pure in its ways. Every man must hold in and we get the book of Ecclesiastes. Must hold in moderation his love for a friend and his hatred for a foe. Why should you be moderate in your love for a friend? And in hatred. I mean, it's easier to understand the hatred for a foe. Why shouldn't you overlove a friend? Well, sometimes friends become unfriends, right? Okay, that's one possibility. But what else? What did the wanderer tell us happens to friends in money, in life, 
and joy in women. Yeah, they all die. They all go away. All right? Why moderation and hatred for a foe? Why shouldn't we cast our foes in pejorative terms? You know, those damn Japs, they attack us. Why don't we still use the term Japs like we did in 1940 through 1945? Or Jerry like we did in 1940 to 45 to describe Germans? It's not simply an abbreviation. Jerry rigged means half assed. Okay? So when you jerry rig something, it means you're doing it like the Germans did. Even though today we say, hmm, German engineering. I'll take that, please, compared to most American engineering. Right? It's the point he's getting at here. What happens when you're not moderate in your hatred for a foe? What do you tend to do to that foe? How about this phrase? demonize. To demonize means you make them into a demon. If you make them into a demon, what are they now not? Human. If they're not human, kill them with impunity, right? It's a lot easier to kill something that's not you than it is something that is you. Like, which is, Char like Charlie in Vietnam? Yeah. Or gooks. Mm -hmm. Even better. That's why Frodo has such a hard time in The Lord of the Rings Understanding when Gandalf says, Gollum is related to you, Frodo. He used to be like a hobbit. He's like, hell he was. Uh-uh. You know? And Gandalf says, you know, if you saw him, you would feel some pity for him. He goes, well, I don't feel any pity for him, and I don't want to. Why? It's a lot easier to hate somebody when you don't feel any pity for him. Because you can just wipe them. Throw them away. They're useless, they're meaningless. Okay? So, must hold in moderation his love for a friend, his hatred for a foe, though he may wish him full of fire. Something is missing here, your boss tells us, though there is no gap in the manuscript. If there's no gap in the manuscript, how do you know something's missing? Because we do have manuscripts. When I was working on the John Dunn very arm, You'd come across every now and then a manuscript that would have half a line and then it would have a space. And sometimes it would have lines. Like you'd have half a line and then you'd have indicating possibly word, 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 word. But I don't know what the word, 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 word is that goes here. So I'm going to leave it blank. Okay? This is an instance where there is no spot left blank. And yet editors say... Something's missing here. The translation is conjectural. It makes as little sense as the original. Though he may wish him full of fire. That, I think that's not necessarily that all not understandable. What's he talking about? You can hate your foe so much, you what? What happened, still angers me when I think about it, really disgusted me about our country. And I'm far right wing. Okay, I'm in like right of Genghis Khan. Okay? <laughs> Ronald Reagan wasn't right wing enough. Okay? But he did some good things. Bush, both of them did some good, et cetera, et cetera. When Obama announced the death of Osama bin Laden, a couple of things happened. One, there were parades. There were people celebrating in the streets, okay? which I thought was absolutely disgusting. Why? All his faults, he was still a living, breathing human being, the like of which the world will never see again. That is, we will never see the individual Osama bin Laden. With all his bad traits, yes. He also had some good traits. Same thing applies, I know some of you are going to think, I am totally out of my rocker. Same thing applies to Hitler, applies to Stalin, applies to Mao. Some of you will say, will apply to George W. Bush when he dies, will it apply to H.W. when he dies, etc. People said it about Reagan, you know, he was evil incarnate, but I once had a student, my first, second year here, was writing a paper, and he came up with a triumvirate, like three 
people who ruled? Lincoln, Hitler, Stalin. This is Abe Lincoln. This guy's from Piedmont country, Virginia. And was, I am sure, a card carrying KKK member. And I was going on about, you know, why the KKK is, you know, worthless slime of the earth, et cetera, et cetera. Right? We can hate our enemies what? Over much. And at the same time, when when um, Obama announced that, Mike Huckabee, former governor of Arkansas, former presidential candidate, anybody know what he said? He wasn't the only one. There were a bunch of televangelists and et cetera who said the same thing. Rot in hell. Immediately ascribing to himself what? If one accepts the Christian tradition. The place of judge. Who gets that place? Not me, not you, not Mike Huckabee, etc. That to me is not holding in moderation what he's what the poet is talking about. Something or his friend consumed on a funeral pyre. This I think is explaining why you should hold your friend, your love for friend, in moderation. Why? If you place all your love in that friend, all your if, if part of all your love is all your joy, all your happiness, what happens when that person dies? That dies too. Been married almost 33 years. It seems to me what the poet is saying there and what I've come to experience in my own life is my entire existence does not depend upon my wife's existence. My entire joy does not exist on my wife's well, it does exist on my wife's joy. Unhappy wife, unhappy wife. <laughs> so I should take that part out. It does not depend on her existence, though. If she were to die today, would I be destroyed? Pretty much. Would I be able to go on living? I hope so. I don't know so. Or if one of my kids, you know, because I've known people who've had their kids killed or died. And those situations, I think, I don't know that I could go on. Okay? That's why he's saying, have that love in moderation. Okay? Fate is greater, the maker mightier, than any man's <clears throat> thoughts. Because our thoughts can be pretty mighty, right? I mean, what did um, Oppenheimer say down there at Alamogordo, New Mexico, when they detonated the first nuclear bomb? I am become death. What's the rest of the line? Destroyer of worlds. Now that's a that's saying a lot, right? Okay, but the speaker is saying that ain't nothing. Not compared to the might of the maker, though that speaker didn't have any idea of nuclear weapons and you know what they're <laughs> capable of. So let us consider where we should have our home. Now look at your gloss. The tone of these last lines, different in many respects from the rest of the poem, seems to place the poem finally, that is ultimately, like this is the whole purpose of the poem, in a homiletic setting. The exhortation of a preacher rather than the confession of a weathered Samuel Taylor Coleridge's ancient mariner. Well, I don't think the poem anywhere gives off the idea of an ancient mariner like Coleridge's poem. Because it seems to me, at least, that the poet's been talking fairly clearly from the beginning about life as what? Life is a pilgrimage. The only difference between life as a pilgrimage and you're going to, you know, uh, let's say you're Muslim. You're going to Mecca is what? You know where Mecca is. <laughs> you know how to get there. Life's a pilgrimage. Okay, let's say he's talking about the Christian notion of heaven. Do you have the road map? I mean, even if you follow Sola Scriptura, does that give you the exact roadmap? Do X, Y, Z. No. There are various things. Christ says, 
do the things I tell you, do the will that I, but then there are other passages that say kind of, I don't want to say, they're not contradictory things, they're like positives, they fill in. But it's not like everybody, you get born and you get the little God's plan for your life, and it's all spelled out. Do this when you're 18, and this when you're 19, and this when you're 70, and collect the bypass jail and go straight to go ticket when you die. Okay? The divine monopoly game. So let us consider where we should have our home, and think, then think how we might come there. Well, what is that home? Go back to... So that I might seek a foreign land somewhere far from here. I think all throughout the poem he's been talking about this. Right? It's just my opinion. Right? Could be totally wrong here. Totally wrong, possibly. Because I hate YouTube, you know, people go, you're totally wrong about this. You know? <laughs> Raised within a Christian tradition, my father was a minister, etc. I kind of have a background that a lot of English professors don't have. I have a level of biblical literacy that a lot of English professors don't have. Okay? And so I understand some nuances. And I think that's the way you have to approach a lot of this. The home is what? Biblically, what, are, what is human life often referred to as? This isn't the word that's used. It's this. A sojourn. Because this implies there is a destination. A sojourn, a journey, doesn't necessarily imply that. Sometimes it's just wandering. What happened to the, happens to the Israelites when they leave, leave Egypt? They wander for 40 years. Why? Because God doesn't know where he's going to lead them? No, he does. They screw up. And so he does what? He crosses off the destination and says, no, nah, you guys are just going to wander until you all die. <laughs> and your children will enter the destination. Okay? Still kind of wandering, right? So, let us strive also, let us also strive to reach that place of eternal peace, unending blessedness, where life is found in the love of the Lord, hope in heaven. So notice what it is. Unending, uh, excuse me, eternal peace. See, the Anglo-Saxons didn't experience much eternal peace. They didn't experience much peace. They had from the year 793, almost until the time this manuscript was written in about 1000 AD, somewhat regular problems with the Vikings. Even in the later, the latter hundred years, I mean, there would be Viking raids. We think of the problem of terrorism as being new. Nonsense. You know, there's a reason there's a phrase, the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. Why? It's really one of the only known periods in history where you get like several decades where there's no real war going on. Well, we've had the Pax Americana. When is that? End of Vietnam to when? Roughly little skirmish having to do with Kuwait in 1991. When did Vietnam end? 75. How long? 16 years. And even that wasn't totally free, you know, because you had Reagan's little you know, thing with Grenada in 87, so that's 12 years. <laughs> and then there are little things in between all that because there were terrorist incidents and such. So, you want... Peace, you want stability? That's where to look for it. Thanks be to the Holy One that he has so honored us, ruler of glory, eternal Lord, throughout all time. And all God's people, you know, it's almost like he says, all right, now let's have the altar call. No, because I don't think it is a necessarily in a homiletic kind of setting. I don't think this is a preacher standing up and thus saith the Lord. And he starts talking about being in a little boat out on the sea and fat dumb slobs, you know, like you in that front pew. No, it's what? It's allegorical. Allegorical, but not necessarily allegory. 
That is, it's like an allegory, but it's not necessarily is an allegory. Why? Because I don't think the speaker of the poem is saying the ship or the, the journey only equals life going to heaven. The home far from it doesn't only mean heaven. It can also mean, you know, I'm from California. It could also mean Tennessee. <laughs> I left a long ways away and ended up in Tennessee. It could mean going from England to Iceland or something like that. Okay, we'll stop there. So for Thursday, we'll do the dream of the rude. Rude is the old English word for cross. Okay, It's not where the cross has a dream. It's where a guy has a dream where the cross of Christ speaks to him. So if there is a quiz on Thursday...